Good evening and welcome to NUPI for this evening's seminar with the Honorable Ambassador Ichiro Fujisaki. My name is Renya Lingren. I am a research fellow here at NUPI and I have the honor of being the chair this evening. The topic of discussion is Japan's perspective on a changing Asia. Asia is currently experiencing a period of extensive political and economic change. Recent leader tra leadership transitions in China and North Korea have bred both challenges and opportunities. And though the US has announced a pivot towards the East Asian Pacific region, it remains largely preoccupied by events in the Middle East. After a long period of stagnation, Japan's economy appears to be while Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is seemingly altering the fundamental, fundamental tenet of the country's security policy, which has been largely unchanged over the past century. We will a 45-minute presentation by Ambassador Fujisaki, who will, provide, who will provide a Japanese view on such key developments across the region. Then, NUPI Senior Researcher Mark Lantang will provide some of his comments before we open the floor for questions and discussion. But before we get started, I would like to introduce you to Ambassador Fujisaki. Ichiro Fujisaki is currently the president of the Amer America Japan Society, distinguished professor and chairman of the International Studies at Sophia University, and distinguished professor at Keio University, both in Tokyo. He was educated at Keio University, Brown University, and Stanford Graduate School, and he was a research associate at the International Strategic Studies in London before entering Japan's ministry, foreign ministry, in 1969. At the ministry, he held posts in Jakarta, Paris, and London before taking on more serious roles, including political counselor at the Embassy of Japan in London, political minister at the Embassy of Japan in Washington, D.C., and Director General for North American Affairs and Deputy Foreign Minister. From 2005 until 2008, he served as the Ambassador to Japan for the UN and the you know, World Trade Organization in Geneva before taking up the post of Ambassador of Japan 
to the United States from 2008 until October of 2012. We are very pleased to have Ambassador Fuji Suzuki here with us this evening at NIFI, and I hope you join me in wishing him a very warm welcome. Uh, good dog. Uh, uh, will come and uh, tell me uh, full and drug. Uh, I, I wanted to continue, but I, I will not do that. Uh, uh, thank you very much for being here. And uh, well, uh, what I'm going to say may be a little different from what uh, Renzan said in two senses. I'm not going to speak for five minutes. I think that's a little too long. So I'll try to finish in 30 minutes and uh, we'll have more Q&A session. Uh, second, uh, uh, she said, uh, Abe Shinzo is changing its uh, security policy, uh, not uh, uh, like other, any other prime ministers before. And I think uh, my thesis is, is a little different. Uh, I am now retired from Japanese foreign ministry. Uh, well, uh, I retired on November 2012. And uh, on that day, when I retired, I said, uh, now I can speak anything after 43 years of diplomacy. My friend said, no one cares anymore. So, <laughs> so thank you very much for being here. T today, uh, the world has changed, really. 20 years ago, people thought the world will be a little bit more peaceful and quiet. Strong emerging countries like China, Brazil will lead our economy. And the pandemic was only a theme of uh, fiction. Now it's totally different. It's not quiet at all. We see Crimea, Ukraine, Islamic State, uh, the uh, quarrel, well, disputes uh, around China. And everything is happening in the world. And uh, economy, those uh, once strong economies uh, are uh, slowing down as well. And uh, lots of uh, issues like environment issues facing them. Uh, pandemic as we see, like Ebola, Wills, or bird flu and all that uh, is all there. Now, in that uh, situation, uh, how do we analyze the situation? One thing that we are seeing now is that some countries or some group are doing things unexpectedly, using force against international rules or norms, which people didn't think that would happen in 21st century. Second, the situation cannot be coped with by any one country, even the United States. And that needs a lot of cooperation amongst countries. This is, these two are the features of uh, the issues of today. Now, in order to cope with that, I think uh, it's a uh, tourism that uh, we have to cooperate together but some things we have to be careful is that some notions either fix or uh, fixed ideas would hamper those international corporations if someone had some wrong views of others that is exactly what I'm trying to address three issues regarding Japan. One is that, hey, Abe is coming here, changing security policy, trying to revise history, tilting to the right, and giving concern to other Asian countries. That's one. Second, country like Japan, it's busy with situation in Asia or Asia Pacific. 
and doesn't really have too much role in the international scene. For example, Norway is not a big country, but it has served a big role in Sri Lanka, Middle East, and compared to that, Japan is not that much interested in elsewhere. Third notion is that Japan economy is recovering after two lost decades at last, but it's still superficial and structural reform is not that there yet. And there's no prediction that it will come. These are the three things I would like to address today, if that's true or not. And uh, I very much uh, appreciate uh, your uh, question as well, or discussions. As for uh, Abe's uh, theory, uh, the uh, theme on security issues, it is true that new policies have been adopted, like establishment of National Security Council, relaxing of arms export, and more importantly, approving the right of collective self-defense, the changing the interpretation of the Constitution. These have come all in one year and uh, giving the impression that Japan is now going to rearm and uh, say goodbye to the sort of pacifist uh, posture that they had for five decades. That's totally wrong. One, because all these measures are taken to fortify its relations, security relations with the United States. Japan's security is far more difficult than 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Now North Korea is launching missiles so often over Japan, nuclear tests prepared from time to time. Chinese vessels are intruding into our territorial sea. These situations were not there 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So the Cold War is, of course, over in this part of the world, but the vice, it's very complicated. And against that backdrop, the importance of US security commitment, security alliance is becoming more important. People think we have a issue of little islands with uh, China. They have come to our territorial sea. And we think the biggest deterrence we have is United States commitment. U.S. saying that Article 5 of uh, uh, Japan U.S. security arrangement covers those islands and U.S. opposes any unilateral action to change that. Uh, Article 5 means U.S. security obligation. Obama said this for the first time as the U.S. president this April, only seven months ago, six months ago. And Japanese people really were relieved to hear that. And uh, so this is to fortify our relations and not to go independent uh, because uh, it's very clear that Japan's uh, defense posture is uh, totally defense oriented and we don't have offensive weapons such as long-range bombers 
aircraft carriers, and these we think are prohibited by constitution, and that is not revised. We have not changed the constitution on that. So we will keep to our defense-oriented nature of weapon uh, acquirement, uh, acquisition. So uh, uh, that's uh, one thing. And the uh, United States have appreciated that. And when Obama came in April, he said, U.S. welcomes and supports Japan's consideration of the uh, self, uh, collective self-defense. And uh, the uh, Japanese prime minister and uh, president of the United States said uh, United States uh, uh, position of uh, rebalancing in Asia uh, goes hand in hand with uh, Japan's proactive peace policy. That is Abe's policy. So uh, there's no misunderstanding between Japan and United States on in that role. Sh uh, sharing. What Japan was concerned is that when Japan's uh, security is uh, becoming a little uh, more dangerous than before, we don't want to see a situation where U.S. administration is told by U.S. Congress and U.S. people, why do we have to send troops? Why do we have to shed blood of young men and women of the United States when Japan is not doing its part at all. So that is why we are say saying that we would do the self-collective uh, defense. Uh, and uh, the laws have to be uh, prescribed from now, but the cabinet has changed the position. And this is where we are. Second, on history issue. Some people say that uh, this government of Japan is trying to relook at history and change its policy. This is because of two reasons. One, because Abe visited last December Yasukuni Shrine. Second, because Korean friends have always been saying that Japan is not doing enough for comfort women, uh, the women who were used uh, uh, during World War II. And uh, in 1993 and 1995, Japanese government has issued statements. 93, uh, Chief Cabinet Secretary uh, issued a statement on comfort women. 95 Prime Minister issued a statement on World War II as a whole. In it, they expressed a deep remorse and apology to what we did before and during World War II. And this government has said clearly that we will not revisit, revise those positions that has been expressed in 93 and 95 uh, statements of uh, Chief Cabinet Secretary and Prime Minister. It is true that some of the politicians have of the uh, government party has, and also many critics have said, why do we have to be uh, uh, bound by those statements. Uh, the basic data has changed. We should not, we should relook at them. And there are those views as well. But the government position is very clear and we will not do that. Now, uh, let's look at the uh, policy uh, of Japan. Uh, with other Asian countries. Uh, 
I'm sorry, before that, I will say uh, why Japan do not really want to change uh, its policy on defense or security or all over security. Because I think most of the Japanese are happy with the situation. Japan is clean as Norway, peaceful as Norway, and not too many people really want a basic change. Some politicians may want to have a big change, but all in all, people are very happy. Some people may remember that in August 2010, Newsweek magazine issued the best countries in the world. Any of you have seen it? This is the best country in the world. According to that, over overall ranking, the number one is Finland, two Switzerland, three Sweden, four Australia. Five Luxembourg, six Norway, seven Canada, nine Nether eight Netherlands, nine Japan, ten Denmark was the result. However, amongst the populous country, the big countries, the ranks were number ten Turkey, number nine Russia. Number eight, Brazil. Number seven, Mexico. Number eight, Italy. Number five, France. Number four, UK. Number three, Germany. Number two, United States. Number one, Japan. So, no, uh, this, this was the magazine. And I don't know. Uh, uh, one thing I can say tell you is that uh, the Japanese government didn't pay for that uh, this, but but but, uh, but uh, I don't know how accurate this is but all in all Japanese uh, think that their society is quite comfortable so there's no really strong desire to change and that is one thing that uh, not too many people appreciate it. Now, our relations with Asia. There's one poll which was done in March 2013. It was done by Hong Kong company and the Japanese government. So I have to say that this is not has little Japanese influence, maybe, but uh, in that uh, they asked uh, which is the most reliable countries to seven ASEAN countries. And the reason I say this is that uh, I recall that once Chancellor Schmidt came to Japan and uh, said, right, Germany has uh, many friends now. All the friends surrounding Germany is friend. Japan doesn't have friends in surrounding countries. I of course, I was not speaking with him, but uh, if I were there, I would have raised my hand and uh, asked him, but do you have North Korea in your neighbor? But uh, I wasn't able to do that. Uh, and uh, all in all, this poll 
Japan was 33% as the most reliable country. US 16, UK 6, China 5, Australia 5, New Zealand 4, Germany 3, Russia 3, Korea 2. So this is just one example, and I'd say that uh, Japan was uh, in the uh, this endeavor for the uh, ball. So uh, there's that element as well. But you would see that overall, unlike some Western media would like to sketch, all in all, in ASEAN countries, at least, we are pretty much welcomed and we are close friends. Our problem are two countries, except for North Korea, China and Korea. Now, let's look at China. China is our important partner. It's a number one trading partner for us, for them, number four. And for us, uh, uh, for them, uh, it's a number four trading partner and number four investing country, Japan is. It's, it's, our investment is dropping very rapidly now because of political situation, but still we are so important to each other, far more important than any other country in Asia. So, there's no reason that we should be antagonistic towards each other. However, this history issue was there, that which I explained, and also one more is this island issue. Some people say that uh, uh, Japan has not been so flexible. They should have gone to negotiating table with China on those issues or to international court. But I have never seen any country who has governed some part of his or her territory, island or whatever, for more than a century. And then when other countries, when they come, would go to, and when other countries would intrude it, they would both go to international court or negotiating table. They don't do that. They just defend it. And that's what we are doing. I would not go into the reason of why it is Jap Japan or whatever. That is too long. But if there's any question, I'm all, always uh, ready to answer. Relations with Korea, Republic of Korea. Are we both are concerned about North Korean situation and we are have to really work hand in hand. Uh, we are both democratic country and it, it is unfortunate that uh, history issue still is lingering. But I hope that uh, with time uh, we could uh, sit down and ameliorate our relations. We, it, there has been ups and downs, and very frankly, now is a low time. This is the first issue that I wanted to discuss, this uh, security and history. In short, we are not changing that much because people are happy. We, with China and Korea, we think that... Uh, uh, our doors are open. Uh, our leaders are always open for dialogue. We're not in rush, but we uh, want to ameliorate our relations. Second issue of uh, our interest uh, into the uh, rest of the world. Japan after World War II has decided that because uh, we can't really uh, go to uh, arms building, for example, defense, uh, arms build, uh, defense building uh, budget is uh, increased last year by 2.04%, 2% only. And uh, out of 2.04, 2% 2 with a salary rise 
uh, which uh, we had been suspending. So actual increase was 0.04%. China has uh, increased 4,000% in 26 years, 400% in 10 years. So it's far, it's two times bigger than us and still increasing 10% uh, by year. So compared to that, uh, our defense spending is sometimes criticized as too small, but uh, we are determined not to go to uh, those uh, uh, strong uh, military country. However, we think it's important that uh, we will uh, be contributing to world uh, peace. And uh, as for UN Security Council, uh, I'm sorry, UN contribution, we are second. Our contribution is uh, more than France, China, and Russia added. And that is one of the reasons that Japan has been claiming to be a permanent member of Security Council. But m more important reason is that I think it's awfully difficult to tell to new countries arising not to go to nuclear when all the permanent seat members are nuclear countries. The, if the management board is all nuclear and you tell, tell people that you shouldn't go nuclear, it's the, I, I think we it's time after 70 years to change the thinking. This is what we're working on. We don't think this will happen right away. It'll take time. Maybe it'll take long, long time, but I think we have to be on that road. And we've been uh, working on uh, Africa, uh, the conference on that, uh, Tokyo conference on uh, African development, Ebola. We've been taking strong attitude on Ukraine, and uh, we've told that to Lavrov and Putin as well. We can't let tolerate a country uh, trying to use force to change this border or situation. So we'll be very adamant about it. And Middle East, we've been the uh, number two contributor to nation building of both Afghan and Iraq. That fact is not known. We are only after the United States. And these are the uh, contribution that Japan is making. And Japan is uh, trying to be a country which could uh, uh, contribute to, uh, through uh, infrastructure building and nation building. Third element, the uh, Japan's economy. As I said, a uh, lot of people say that uh, 2000, well, uh, when Prime Minister Abe came to power, uh, Japan had been in two lost decades. Prime Minister says that too. Very frankly, in any democratic leader would say that before him or before her, it was a dark middle age, nothing was happening, <laughs> if I may say. Uh, uh, Clinton said that, Bush said that, Obama said that, Abe is saying that. But in reality, was that really so? From 2003 to 2007, Japan's growth rate, GDP growth rate, was 2%. Two, 2%. It was about the same as Eurozone. Not that different from US. US was 2.7, and it was higher. So we were starting to grow from two thousand five years, from 2003 to 2007. What happened in 2008? What? Wall Street crash, the Lehman Brothers. That started in Wall Street, but it hit Japan most. Why? Because Japan's output are something like camera, automobile, computer, which you can wait to buy. You don't have to buy today. If you're exporting 
or producing wheat, meat, you have to eat it every day. So Japanese industrial output went down by 22% in 2009. Export went down by 33%. GDP went down by 5.5%. That was the lowest in 50 years. So Japan was hit so heavily. And then in 2010, we started to grow again. Our GDP grew by more than 4%. And then what happened? Earthquake tsunami in 2011 came in March 11. So very frankly, uh, I'm not trying to s s uh, tell that external cause was the reason, but it was not as flat as some people say that nothing was happening in for two decades and suddenly it's changing. But it is true that uh, Abe was smart in grasping the very essence of economy, I should say. The very essence of economy is not mathematics only. It's psychology. If people think economy is going to be good, people will spend people will invest. If economy is going to be bad, people think they will just keep it and not spend or not to invest. He changed the psychology, turn around the table by increasing the monetary basis, increasing the fiscal basis. And now people are far more optimistic about future. Of course, inviting Olympic Games and things like that helped as well. Now the element we are facing is structural reform. Can we really do that? But if you look at it, uh, we are starting it in agricultural field. Those agricultural corporation once dominated is going to be dissolved, the, not totally dissolved, but taken power off and it'll be more uh, made freer, liberalized. Uh, as for medical areas where there was a very strong restrictions, also special district will be introduced. Special districts are six, six, uh, six and that would cover 30% of GDP. So it's a, not sm so small as you may think. And so in these areas, which were called rock hard restrictions, there are moves as well. One thing it may not be that clear is uh, immigration uh, yet, but uh, in all others, I think it's moving. And uh, it's trying to use a woman's power more because in J Japan, women's power is not uh, used like in European countries yet. Our birth rate is uh, 1.3 and that's too low. So uh, population is quickly decreasing. Very frankly, it's uh, too populated as well, Japan. I people wouldn't say that, but uh, I would say it. I personally feel, uh, of course, in the United States, there's 50 states, and Japan is the size of California. It's a big state, but uh, Japan, 80, more than 75% of that land is mountain, not inhabitable. So there's only a small strip of land there, and we have 40% of U.S. population there. 120 million there in that small strip of land. So it's very crowded. But, uh, and only 60 years ago, it's uh, half the population, so we increase very quickly. But, so we can't uh, really, 120 may be a little too, too much, but uh, we should have about 100 million to go. Uh, and uh, we have the present uh, policies to continue that level of about 100 million. And that's not easy. So uh, immigration has to be maybe looked at in the future. Uh, women's working uh, condition has to be, be improved. And uh, those things are done now.
the uh, all in all Japan's policy I, I think can be summarized to two in politics and security we'll try to be a stabilizing power not big changes although them look may look cha bigger change but in reality important thing is no use of force which is not in line with international law and norms. Second is growth, change in economy. So stability in political security and growth in economy. That's the balance that Japan is going to pursue. And uh, uh, we can't do it alone, so we would like to cooperate with all others, and uh, we're very happy to cooperate with Norway in that sense as well. One last thing I want to say is that uh, we are now recovering after 311. Huge loss, disaster, but we were helped by people around the world, including Norwegians. And thank you very much for all you've done to stand with us at our most difficult moment in our modern history. So, from the bottom of our heart, I will say, I'm not an ambassador anymore, but I will say, Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Fujisaki, for your insightful comments. Uh, I would now like to welcome uh, Senior Nuclear Speaker Mark von Heim to the podium to make a few comments on Ambassador Fujisaki's remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And let me also reiterate my thanks uh, to Professor Fujisaki for a very insightful, very thought provoking and uh, very comprehensive look at some of the issues that are currently being looked at, uh, not only in the question of security in Asia, but also politics, foreign policy. Many issues have been um, discussed uh, this afternoon. I will keep my comments short. I imagine there's uh, questions to follow. Um, to start my comments, one point that struck me, uh, not only in the presentation tonight, but also in quite a few comments regarding the situation in Asia as a whole, is how many comparisons have been given, especially recently. This is a very uh, historically significant year, 100th anniversary of the start of the First World War. And understandably, there have been uh, quite a few writings which have talked about uh, the role of 1914 and whether or not history in some ways is repeating itself. And this has even been brought up in the case of East Asia. Certainly there is potential for debate there, but when you look at 100 years ago versus today, you look at it in the Asian viewpoint, certainly yes, you do see some points of division. You look at the international community today, we are starting to see as some people call the return of great power politics. We see all kinds of debate over the dynamics, the United States, Russia, and China. We see power politics in some ways being played out in the Asia Pacific, issues such as maritime interest, issues such as uh, difficulties regarding uh, the global economy, the regional economies. So certainly there is some area, there are some areas where divisions are starting to appear, but even though it's very easy to make 1914 comparisons, especially with all of these history books coming out over the past year, it's very important to remember that there's also quite a lot of difference between 100 years ago and today. There's also a lot of areas where cooperation is possible that simply was not a situation 100 years ago. These new forms of cooperation have taken on many forms. There are organizations in Asia that are still very new, some of them still finding their sea legs. Everything from APEC to the East Asian Summit to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a very ambitious 
a set of free trade talks, which are just getting going. There's also globalization, which gets brought up quite a bit. We can certainly set up a different panel just talking about globalization, not just the obvious economics, but also uh, technological communications. The types of organizations, institutions, and just means of uh, communication have changed so much. Never mind in the last 100 years, let's just look at the last 10 to 20. We see quite a bit of change. When looking at relations in Asia, it's not necessarily enough just to look at government to government relations. There are so many other ways that parts of Asia, all parts of Asia, are starting to cooperate and communicate. There's been so much written about soft power. And soft power can be a very interesting and sometimes a very uh, important uh, focus when looking at uh, not only Asian politics, but also uh, international relations around the world. That, struck me very recently. I've only been in Norway for a little over a month now. And when I was telling my colleagues that I was coming to Norway, I got quite a few messages, quite a few messages of congratulations. And more than half of them mentioned the movie Frozen. So you really do get an idea of how soft power does tend to have an effect in some ways. Beyond that, you have other areas where cooperation is being seen uh, in Asia and elsewhere. There is so much dialogue about reforms to peacekeeping border peace transitions. There are many challenges, as was noted, in the area of health, in the area of transnational crime. Uh, at present, um, one of the areas that I've looked at uh, since arriving here is the question of the Arctic. Many Asian states, many Asian governments are now starting to look at the Arctic as a very important area of scientific research and potentially as an area for scientific cooperation. So all of that is starting to bring together new avenues, new areas of cooperation, which definitely have an effect when we get back to the question at the beginning, are we seeing some kind of 1914 scenario? And I'm certainly not going to go too much into the historical background. I will finish instead by saying that history itself is not inevitable. The future itself is not inevitable. So these are the ideas that I'd like to leave you with. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for your comments. I would now like to open the floor to the audience for their questions and comments. I ask that when you make a question to please introduce yourself um, and to be brief if you have a longer comment. Yes. Uh, <coughs> what you, speak, you said was with your mind, but I thought you really very much had said you have to defend traditional Japanese viewpoint. But I think to me it's like it shouldn't be necessary to defend these viewpoints. The Koreans and I mean, with all this play the Second World War card, it is very difficult to understand. But it will Thank you very much. I think uh, uh, if uh, Mr. Abe hears you, I think uh, he'll be so happy and uh, will uh, ask you to be uh, the speaker for Japan rather than me. Uh, uh, I think I'll be uh, out right away. Uh, however, the reason I wanted to make this argument is that because the leader really would usually bring a new word and try to uh, send a new message, and uh, it, it, there ha is uh, something new in that, but in reality, the very essence, we are continuing our policy since the end of the World War uh, for all, all 50 years. 
the Japanese the only uh, the uh, Conservative Party's policy was to depend on security mainly with the United States and try to build Japan Japanese economy through corporations and infrastructures and try to boost the economy and those are hand in hand and of course there are nuanced differences with the prime ministers more pacifist more aggressive but all in all i think that's the realm uh, and uh, we we haven't really gone that much change i'm not trying to defend uh, japan's policy it just was to explain it now talking about uh, what uh, uh, my friend said uh, about uh, 1914 and uh, he said that uh, there are some similarities and he doesn't think that it's all similar as well. I share that because often, more often than not people forget two things very frankly. One is that in 1914 there was no real international laws, rules when country were invading others, if they were stronger, that's just because they are stronger, so they would make colonized or whatever, and everything. That, that's the, the second element, is that uh, today's world, many of the countries have democracy, some are not, and some would not give freedom of speech to people. You have to differentiate those two sets of people, countries. We pretend, if I may say, to try to treat them as the same countries, or this country, that country, however. And do you know how I would uh, differentiate those countries which have more freedom and not it's simple do you have political cartoonist that's the if you have political cartoonist in one country i think and criticizing the leader of how stupid he or she is i think that country has a is one of us Thank you very much. Any more questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, my name is Ulaf Mambek. I'm a Japanese research institute. It's a completely more prestige to tell your name. That we that one should change the future on nuclear weapons in Japan. Well, I, I wonder what you mean by that. And also, I also uh, his seminar some years back is broke public. You were skeptic for a while. Uh, pardon me. And and uh, and he I asked him about uh, about the nuclear weapons in Japan and the U.S. And he said he didn't remember really if it was uh, six weeks or six months it would take to come up with nuclear weapons in Japan. So, uh, how do you comment on this? And how and what do you what do you mean with this? How could you change? I'm sorry. Uh, maybe uh, uh, there has been some misunderstanding. As for nuclear, or I did not talk about nuclear in my speech, but I said Japan is not changing its defense-oriented posture. We would not acquire uh, weapons like bombers, aircraft carrier, long-range missiles, because they are deemed to be offensive. As for nuclear, I think, uh, I don't know how 
long as well. But at present, there's no strong desire in Japan amongst Japanese to acquire nuclear weapons. We know that uh, not too many countries around us would welcome that, and that will trigger nuclear weapon competition. So it's, that's one reason. Second, I don't think our ally will like it as well. Uh, I think uh, here in Europe as well, Germany would not be, if they go on uh, nuclear, they will not be too much welcomed by surrounding countries too. I think uh, what for us is more important is a peaceful environment. And uh, as long as U.S. is credible partner, I don't think Japanese would need to change its policy. So for that, uh, it was very important that Obama said in April that those islands now being intruded would be covered by U.S.-Japan Security Act and any attempt to change that unilaterally would be opposed by United States. So that, I think, was the biggest deterrence. I don't think there's a uh, feeling to change uh, our policy on nuclear. And uh, uh, the reason, uh, I'm, uh, thank you very much. I will be careful. I may have sounded a bit defensive. I think that's, uh, I wanted to explain that uh, we, in, and that's my personal feeling, and that J J Japan, Japanese is not that changing rapidly. We are happy with this uh, situation, and maybe some leaders uh, may say something different, but all in all, J Japanese have been maintaining this uh, this line. This was what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Do you think you're also kind of that you have to discuss it with you? Why would it be if they would take the initiative, like the state, not to be willing to force the Senate, for example? Then, uh, would you have some confidential information? <laughs> we don't say it, tell it to anyone. <laughs> 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 comments on, uh, on the peace to us and relationship in the future? What, what, what is the strategy? Uh, very good uh, question, and uh, I think uh, what I'm saying is that uh, we are trying to fortify our relations with the United States through this uh, plan A of uh, uh, collective uh, self-defense and armed sales, and we think this is the, for the foreseeable future, that's the most appropriate, efficient security policy for Japan. If we start to talk about Plan B, as you have suggested, it will undermine the importance of Plan A. And that is not exactly what we are after. So I think our uh, effort will be exerted towards fortifying Plan A from every aspect and not to discuss Plan B. Thank you very much.
John Todd, and I have no particular connection to MP students. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, my question kind of I guess is is a little bit on, on the back of the last one, uh, in that whilst as you say, Plan A is there and it's the the relationship with the United States, but I think it's good to be highly reviewed on a model for more regional jury cooperation, notwithstanding that relation or that sort of bilateral relationship with the United States. Very frankly, ten years ago or so, people were more talking about the ASEAN Regional Forum developing into some sort of uh, basis for regional security. But uh, that kind of enthusiasm is not that strong now, I have to admit, with what's happening really in South China Sea or East China Sea. We may talk about it, but uh, that's for the uh, future uh, brainstorming. It's always important to discuss those things. But if uh, there's a strong willingness to go for Asia-Pacific community or uh, other Asian regional forum for uh, security, I think uh, First, a lot of people would like to see how the present situation settles in this part of the world. Uh, all the disputes with uh, Vietnam, Phil uh, Philippines, Japan, and all these issues are still there, which ha have to be tackled. And if these are sort of peacefully sort of tackled, I think uh, then there could be a atmosphere rising for those, but I, I don't think not now. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I think I, I, I share your general insight that uh, the development relation primarily uh, in the future seems to be changed. And as I say, in, in terms of international relations, uh, they have no problem whatsoever with Prime Minister Abe continuing to be uh, conservative. Um, however, in this huge on history, uh, we won't call him a revisionist, as he also presents in his primary policy that the ruling way was the post war legacy or was something that was interchangeable with imperialism. I think so that during his first term, uh, we have seen that uh, the Japanese population, nation, uh, did not support his revisionist policy. Uh, it was that during the year that they uh, did not make um, a huge impact. At that time, could we say at this moment that um, Prime Minister Abe has a relatively high support because he is successful in Bobo but when those who are less successful, or when he is no longer successful in those fields, that he will once again lose the popularity nation is maybe not inclined to change in a revisionist way like Prime Minister Abe. Uh, thank you very much for a very insightful uh, uh, statement and question. And uh, two or three points. One, when uh, Abe stepped down uh, six years ago, it was not because uh, his policy was not accepted, revisionist policy was not accepted. It was because of his health problem and his relations with then opposition parties. Opposition party was strong then and uh, had upper house uh, uh, as well. So you could not really 
go through budget or whatever legislation without the corporation. And he, he wasn't able to be getting it, so he had to step down. Uh, that uh, and next about uh, his uh, policy now, I don't know very frankly about his deep down psychology, what he is thinking personally when he's in the bed in the evening. I can't imagine what he's thinking, but in his policy, I think he knows that he has to manage relations with his neighboring countries, with the United States, and uh, how people are thinking uh, in general. And his policy now is not trying to be revisionist. He said clearly that he will not revise the position on his uh, previous uh, prime minister's position or chief cabinet secretary's position on comfort woman or World War II. As I said, I don't know what he really has. Uh, is he ha happily doing it or is he not that happily doing it? <laughs> and that I don't know. But he is not trying to change it now. And he thinks as responsible politician, prime minister, he should not do that. I think that is the line that has been developing in this cabinet. And some people are not happy with it. They think they should go more right or to religionists, but that has not become the mainstream. You're not convinced, sir? I think uh, uh, I'll see that uh, uh, all in all, I think uh, Japanese public in general, the reason I cited some of the uh, uh, polls are the present situation, and he knows that uh, Japanese in general do not really change in. Uh, history uh, or uh, relations with surrounding countries and we would like to continue on with what we have offered to other countries. I think he knows that. Thank you. Additional questions from the audience? Thank you. Um, I visited Sweden last year. <laughs> <laughs> The relationship between Japan and China has often been referred to as cold politics, hot economics. The trading relationship between the two countries remains very strong, robust, and yet diplomatically, especially since about 2010 or so, there have been some very considerable problems in the bilateral political relationship. Uh, with the upcoming APEC uh, conference next month in Beijing, there's been a great deal of discussion about uh, which leaders might be in a position to meet with whom. How do you see uh, a possible roadmap away from these current diplomatic difficulties, understanding the problems involved? I hear that, uh, I'm not speaking as an official, but uh, uh, someone uh, who is not in government, I often hear that uh, the Chinese side would attach some uh, uh, conditions to 
the summit and the Japanese side would say that uh, all should be open and we should uh, meet without any uh, prior conditions. And uh, my thinking is that uh, there's a good possibility that the two leaders will meet uh, 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 and. Uh, but one important thing is that uh, the relations are so complicated that one meeting will not uh, just change everything. For example, Obama and Xi Jinping met last August in California for seven, seven hours or eight hours. Some media came up to me and asked, what do you think about the meeting? I said, uh, uh, Japan, uh, U.S. Uh, China relations is like a swing, and sometimes it goes this, sometimes it goes. So I don't think uh, we have to make too much big out of that uh, one meeting. And I was watching the television, uh, how my uh, comment is going to be used, and uh, some of the uh, critics came out and said, uh, U.S. China relations now is fundamentally changing after that long meeting. We are left behind, Japan is left behind. And I was thinking, how will my comment be used? And uh, almost after one hour, the uh, commentator said, uh, oh, there was uh, Fujisaki who used to be in the United States. He said, don't make too much out of it, uh, well, that's all. And let's go to commercial. And so, <laughs> so, so uh, my comment was not much used. But I still believe that uh, one meeting do not change everything. It's better. It's an important step. But for it, Japan, China has a so much complex relations. Japan, U.S., China as well. U.S., China, for example, you have a negative element of Chinese military buildup. Uh, human rights, a rules issue, Taiwan, on the positive side, business, chance, cooperation in the United Nations, control of North Korea, and you have to swing between wit and uh, it's not that just here or here, and J J Japan China relations as well, it goes ups and downs, and, but uh, I hope that meet will will happen and uh, it will start ameliorating but i don't think there's any panacea thank you very much yes uh, my name is Vespi and i am uh, a mayor and i am uh, working at the organization mayors for peace uh, which has the presidency in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, can i make a comment on the fact that the Japanese government is refusing to sign the NPT. In non proliferation treaty. We have been a member of non NPT for a long time. So. You have? Uh, for but, uh, more than four, uh, 40 years, we've been a member. Okay. But the Prime Minister is refusing to sign something. No, no, no. We, yes. are, we are very important member of NPT, and we've been advising all others to join, including India, we were not successful, we, Pakistan, we were not successful, North Korea, uh, we are always telling others to join NPT. We think NPT is so important, and uh, we think, of course, uh, under NPT, our countries have uh, too much uh, privilege over others. Still, it's better than other countries having uh, nuclear weapons. So, we are the staunch uh, supporter of NPT. Well, many of us guide me into this because I was in Nagasaki last year uh, when the mayor Kaua asked directly the prime minister to sign. Uh, you know this story? What what is he refusing to sign? It's of course about nuclear. Uh, what 
problems. Thanks for that. Sorry, I'm you ignorant, I'm ignorant of uh, Lee of uh, I know him, but uh, I'm I'm not ignorant of that story. I'm uh, a friend to me of uh, Hiroshima as well, but uh, I do not know of uh, this same thing. Okay, I'm sorry for the question. I'm not going to go into this, and probably I can uh, find out. Um, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, Julie. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Julie Christensen. I'm with the Research Council in Norway, where I uh, also am responsible to follow up on research collaboration with Japan. The Norwegian government has a science and technology agreement with Japan, and uh, that is uh, very important and exciting to Norway to, to have this collaboration with Japan. But that aside, um, your speech here today concerns uh, Japanese relations to other Asian countries. But I was uh, intrigued to ask uh, what, or wanted to ask you, um, um, what do you think should be at the core of the Japanese relations to to uh, Europe and to the EU? Um, what are the most important um, issues? I'm sure there is a long list, <laughs> but but at the core of this uh, relation between. You and Japan. Uh, I think uh, Japan, uh, especially after this uh, World War II, uh, has become a, a peace-loving uh, and uh, economy-oriented nation, and uh, our relations with Europe is uh, now important. So we are now negotiating. Uh, EPA with EU, and we hope that uh, next year we'll come to uh, progress and agreement on that uh, EPA. Now we are negotiating TPP, but uh, EPA comes after that. Second, uh, we are trying to fortify our relations with NATO. It, it will not be <coughs> alliance, but uh, there could be consultation, discussion, on many, many issues, uh, uh, cyber and others as well. And we think uh, there's a lot of room of cooperation there. And so Europe is very important because we share the same values, uh, as I said, very friendly, cartoonist, political cartoonist. Abe is a very strong leader now, but he's ridiculed by cartoonists every day. And I think that's very important. Uh, if you don't uh, have uh, uh, allow uh, people or critics to criticize your leader, that country, you cannot really 100% share everything with. I think uh, Japan can do that with the United States. Japan can do that with many European countries, maybe not all, but many European countries. With Norway, I think uh, we are a very important partner and we can do that. By the way, uh, today is important for our embassy. We have new ambassador arriving this afternoon, just arrived three hours ago uh, to the airport. Uh, his name is Kunikata, Toshio Kunikata. He was uh, ambassador dealing with Arctic issues uh in tokyo so uh next time uh, please bring him and uh, bombard him with many questions any other questions from the audience yeah <coughs> uh, my name is Fiona. i'm from the central branch it's a very interesting thing to talk also on the economy and I'm very pleased to hear you to be quite positive on the Japanese economy. Not very many are, at least my colleagues. What we say, what we will see in Japan is that you see kind of a rebound after other things in power. You can also say it's because of one of the factors, one of the largest one producing uh, experiments ever seen. Uh, 
can increase policing. Uh, it's one of factors. Prices are increasing, but not maybe the one driven. There could be a lot of higher input prices. And going forward, Japan will need to uh, really a large, very large fiscal consolidation in order to come somewhere close to stabilizing the property price. Uh, also, at some point, they will need to reverse their monetary policy. Uh, and of course, with the rapid digitizing labor force, it's quite really, really future. Uh, really <coughs> The result of some of this could be, of course, the productivity gains, as we, as we spoke of, and maybe the response of the reforms initiative, but they would uh, be large, have a large impact on Japanese society, especially, especially immigration and, and human labor participation in some of these things, most important to, to make the country grow. Uh, so, could you elaborate a bit more on, uh, on do you see the Japanese society being able to Uh, there are several challenges our economy is facing, uh, and uh, from uh, uh, those imminent questions to long range questions. The ones first we have to do in a few months' time is decision on TPP, Trans Pacific Partnership. Are we really to go on? And I hope that we can uh, make decision on that. The US uh, and Japan is now negotiating on details of the automobile uh, board and those issues, but we hope that uh, things would come along. The um, second imminent question is in Japan. Shall we to increase consumption tax from 8% to 10% as already defined, or shall we postpone that? This it was uh, we increased from five to eight last year, and that has already a big impact on GDP. Of course, uh, last year it went up because people tried to buy things before it was raised, but now uh, af aftermath it's uh, rebound and the kind of people are uh, spending less not much. And can we again raise it to 10% is the second question. Third uh, question is corporate tax. We are around about 30%, 34%. We have uh, decided to go down lower than 30 percent uh, by next year's rule law to next year's guide. Uh, and fourth is the nuclear issue. So we, the number three in the world for nuclear power plant. Number one was United States with 107. Number two was France with 57. Japan had 54 plants. And uh, today, and that was 26% of our electricity. And our aim was to increase it to 52% by, in, by 2030. Now, zero is operating after earthquake. And uh, we are, the, this government is trying to restart it. Now, uh, uh, Public Safety Commission is examining very carefully all the land, the environment, and everything. It has given approval to two in the southern uh, part of Japan. Twenty is the hotline to restart. If we are to start it uh, carefully, I think that will change. It. But uh, there are very strong anti-nuclear feeling as well now in Japan. How much we can do it <clears throat> is a very big question. But in the long run, there's the other element to nuclear power generation. Now, US after three months has made zero in 30 years. In that 30 years, Japan made 29, world's number one. 
So when U.S. was starting under Obama, Japan cooperated with U.S. Hitachi cooperated with GU, Toshiba cooperated with Westinghouse, and Mitsubishi were there to help as well. U.S. was not able to do it alone. Now there are only four countries which can export nuclear power plant. France, Russia, China, Republic of Korea. And these are the only four countries, except for Japan. France, under Orlando, said it's going to decrease its dependency from 25 to 50. I don't know how it will be. If we, and that's a huge demand for nuclear power plant in Asia, Middle East, uh, Latin America, and Africa to be as well. Republic of Korea is okay, but shall we really depend everything on Russia and China? How does it strategically, will that be seen? It's something we have to be very mindful about in the long run. Because you know what Russia did with Ukraine uh, on energy. So to depend energy on several countries is a very difficult decision we have to make. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, deviating a little from your question. But we have all these difficult issues we have to cope. The long range issue, as you rightly said, is this population issue women's uh, use of force, immigration. As for immigration, uh, it's uh, the most difficult issue. Women, it's not that difficult, people are. But uh, women, it's more, uh, uh, immigration is more difficult. Uh, we have to relax uh, more, but uh, to what extent is, uh, it has not become a uh, national debate issue because we have been taking rather strict uh, position for a long time compared to European countries. And uh, uh, how open should, should it be, I think, will be a uh, issue we have to be tackling in the years to come. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. And with that, I think we'll have to close this evening's seminar. I'd like to thank Ambassador Ichiro Fujisaki for joining us this evening and all of his insightful um, presentations and answers to questions. And I'd also like to thank you all for coming to Nubi. Thank you very much for excellent questions. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>